Hello, and thank you for joining us for our Facebook Live event, The Benefits of Plant-Based Dog Food, featuring Dr. Jennifer Coates. My name is Jeff Bloom, Education Marketing Director here at Wild Earth. Our goal for today is to share free educational information shared by a veterinary nutrition expert to help our pet parents learn more about how to support their dogs nutritionally. Wild Earth utilizes the powers of plants and science to create a healthy, high protein, nutritionally complete and balanced food for dogs that does not do any harm to other animals or the environment. We are proud to introduce Dr. Jennifer Coates. She is an accomplished veterinarian and writer with years of experience in the fields of veterinary medicine, animal welfare and conservation. After graduating from McGill University, she worked at the Wildlife Habitat Enhancement Council and Animal Welfare Institute for several years before returning to her first love, veterinary medicine. She was valedictorian of her graduating class at the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. And in the years after veterinary school, Dr. Coates has been an associate veterinarian and chief of staff in several veterinary practices in Virginia, Wyoming, and Colorado. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Coates. Thank you so much, Jeff. I am so excited to be here to talk about plant-based diets for dogs. It's a subject that's really near and dear to my heart. And I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. You'll understand why, uh, why that's true. So we're gonna talk about several things today. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about the importance of protein in a dog's diet. And then we're gonna talk about why it's really best not to think in terms of whole protein, but to really think about amino acids um, and, and particularly essential amino acids. And then we're gonna move on and talk about how to feed a plant-based diet or a vegetarian or vegan diet to dogs safely. And then finally, I'm gonna end up with a little uh, case study where we talk about one instance where a plant-based diet could actually offer some potential health benefits in comparison to a meat-based diet. So first of all, protein. Uh, that is definitely the topic that comes up most when I am talking to pet owners about plant-based diets for dogs. And that's for a very good reason. Uh, plant uh, Protein is very, very important uh, for dogs, for us as well. Um, it serves so many roles in the body. Uh, just to name a few, it's an important part of muscles and other tissues in the body. Uh, Disease-fighting antibodies, those are proteins. Um, hormones are proteins. Enzymes, those are the substances that make chemical reactions uh, perform their functions efficient, efficiently. Enzymes are proteins as well. Um, proteins store other substances in the body. They transport substances around the body. So you can see why protein is so important uh, for living things. And li all living things have protein. Uh, animals have protein in their bodies. Plants contain a lot of protein. Microorganisms, things like yeast and bacteria, they also have protein um, in, in their structures. So. You can think about protein from uh, you know, its ubiquitousness because it's so important, but then also since it is present in all living things, it's widely available as, a, as um, a source in the diet. You can get protein from everywhere. You can get it from meat, you can get it from plants, you can get it from microorganisms. Um, so I find protein to just be like a, a fascinating subject um, for in one part because you might think that the most efficient way to get protein from your diet would be you eat something containing protein and then let's say it has a muscle protein in it and then you absorb that muscle protein and it goes to your muscle or it goes to your dog's muscle. But that's not what happens. What happens is a much more eloquent, elegant system than, uh, than that. Protein is often described um, as uh, beads on a necklace, uh, train cars in a train. And what those individual things are, are amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Um, so you have this chain of amino acids that then gets folded up into these really unique structures. And then that is the protein that um, actually is performing its function in the body. So when we eat protein, that complex molecule is broken apart. Now it's broken apart into all of its amino acids and there are 20 of them, um, 20 common ones. There are a few that are, are, are less common, but you can divide those 20 common amino acids into two groups. Uh, there's the non-essential amino acids, 10 non-essential amino acids for dogs. And non-essential doesn't mean they're not important. They are very important. 
but they are easily manufactured by a dog's body. So as long as a dog is kind of eating a nutritionally balanced uh, diet and isn't in a starvation state, state those non-essential amino acids are really never going to come into play nutritionally, nutritionally speaking. Um, the other 10, however, are the essential amino acids. Um, the essential amino acids have to be provided in a dog's diet in adequate amounts, or they will not be able to make the proteins that they need, um, not be able to make those muscle proteins, those uh, antibodies, the enzymes, the hormones that I talked about. So really focusing on those non or those essential amino acids is, is very important when you're talking about uh, protein in the diet of dogs. I'm going to read to you those 10 essential amino acids. I'm going to read them so I don't make a mistake. Uh, they are arginine, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. So those are the 10 essential amino acids for dogs. Um, so if you have a diet for a dog and it is providing those 10 essential amino acids in adequate amounts, and then also enough protein in general, you're going to be meeting all of the dog's needs. Um, and plants can do that. It's, it's fascinating. Plants um, contain all of those 10 am essential amino acids. And then they also contain all the other important nutrients that dogs might need as well. So we're focusing on protein, but the, the true, the, the um, plants are, are nutritionally complete for dogs when they're combined um, in the right manner. And the reason uh, that plants can do that for dogs is, is kind of fascinating. Um, we often think, so, think of dogs as being carnivores. Um, and it's true that they did evolve from wolf-like ancestors, and those ancestors did eat a primi primarily meat-based diet. But that was tens of thousands of years ago. And when you look at our modern dogs now, you know, the changes we've made in them over those tens of thousands of years um, are pretty obviously from a physical point of pretty obvious from a physical point of view. You know, you look at a Maltese or a Newfoundland and they don't look anything like a wolf anymore. Um, behavioral behavioral changes as well, thankfully. Um, they've changed significantly over that amount of time. But there have also been physiological changes and we can't see those, but they're just as striking really. Um, and in one study that was published in 2013 in the journal Nature really pointed this out nicely, I think. Um, the researchers looked at the genomes, the genetic sequences of modern dogs, and then compare, compared those to modern wolves. And there were differences kind of across the board, but some of the most striking differences were in the ability of modern dogs to make use of starch in their diet. Uh, wolves did not have those genetic changes. Modern wolves did not have those genetic changes, but modern dogs did. And starch is only found in plants. And so over the over tens of thousands of years from living with us and kind of eating what we eat and, and that sort of thing, dogs have developed the ability to make use of plants as a good source of nutrition. So they are no longer wolves. Um, now let's shift focus a little bit and look at the diets themselves. Like how can you actually pick a good dog food for your dog, knowing and, and feel confident that it's going to meet all of their nutritional needs. And again, we're going to focus on, on protein again. Um, the first thing to do is to only consider feeding dogs that have a, an, an AFCO statement of nutritional adequacy printed on their label. AFCO is the Association of American Feed Control Officials, um, and AFCO has put together a set of standards that if a dog food meets those standards, they can then put that statement of nutritional adequacy on their, on their, uh, on their label. And you know that that dog food is meeting all of your dog's basic nutritional needs. Um, so you'll know that they have those 10 essential amino acids present in adequate amounts, that it does have enough protein to meet your dog's other protein needs. Um, so that covers their basic needs, but we wanna do better. Um, we don't wanna just cover basic needs. We want our dogs to be as healthy as possible, as happy as possible. And so you can do a little bit better by looking at the guaranteed analysis that is also printed on the dog food label. And the guaranteed analysis will list 
several different nutrients and protein is one of them and they list them as percentages. Um, and the AFCO minimum for protein is 18% for adult maintenance uh, for dogs. So 18% is the bare minimum that you would see there. Protein, however, is one of the more expensive nutrients that are is included in a, in a dog food. And so when you have a manufacturer that's really trying to stick close to those bare minimums, you'll see numbers that aren't much different than 18. Um, when you're looking at the manufacturers that are really trying to go over and above, that are um, thinking about how they can best feed a dog, not just kind of meet those basic needs, you'll see numbers for that protein percentage, uh, 30, 35, that kind of range is, is kind of ideal. So that's another kind of quick and dirty way that you can look at a dog food label and get an idea of A, does it meet the basic needs with that AFCO statement of nutritional adequacy? And B, is the manufacturer going a little further um, and, and not just uh, trying to meet the basic needs, but really trying to help dogs live their best lives. Uh, so finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a case where plant-based diets can actually offer some potential benefits in comparison to meat-based diets. And that's in the case of food allergies. Um, food allergy, food allergic dogs tend to be very itchy. Uh, that itchiness uh, occurs year round. It, it's not dependent on seasons and pollen counts and things like that. Um, they can develop recurrent skin and ear infections, and then they can also have some GI disturbances, loose stools, vomiting, that kind of thing, but that is less, uh, less frequent than is the itchiness and the skin problems that food allergic dogs have. Um, and contrary to popular belief, the primary triggers for food allergic dogs are not grains and not carbohydrate sources. Um, there was a study published in 2016 that investigated the, the most common triggers, and they found that the top three uh, triggers for food allergic dogs were beef, dairy products, and chicken. Um, and those three alone explained two thirds of the food allergies in dogs. Um, there were other meat-based uh, ingredients as well that were included, things like lamb, uh, which was kind of fascinating because you'll see lamb included in a lot of dogs that are, or a lot of diets that are designed for dogs uh, with food allergies. Um, pork was in there, uh, some fish species were in there as well. Um, there were some plants, obviously, that were included as well. The number one uh, plant ingredient that triggers food allergies for dogs is wheat. That was number four after the beef and the dairy products and the chicken. Um, so you can see that if you feed a dog, if you have a dog that you suspect might have food allergies um, and they haven't gone through the full workup, you know, we ha they haven't been through the food trial where you feed the hypoallergenic diet and then you gradually add back in um, different ingredients to figure out exactly what they're allergic to. You know, if you're just like, you know, I think my dog might have food allergies, I wanna try a new food. You can see where feeding a plant-based diet to that dog um, could potentially be beneficial because kind of by definition, you're eliminating the major triggers for food allergies in dogs. And to conclude, um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my personal experience. My professional experience fits with all of that as well. But personally, I had a dog named Apollo a few years back. And Apollo had ridiculously bad food allergies and inflammatory bowel disease. And I searched high and low for a food that would keep his symptoms under control. And the only one I found was a vegetarian dog food. And as long as Apollo only ate that diet, didn't get any table scraps or anything like that, he had no symptoms. Um, as soon as he got into something else, we'd have to put him on a little medication, get things calmed back down, and then he could you know, go back to that diet and, and maintain himself. So I personally have witnessed uh, how a plant-based diet can really um, create a much better quality of life for uh, both a dog and for the people who love that dog. So that's what I have today. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.
Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was so informative. Um, and we actually have some really fantastic questions here. So if you are ready, I will start asking. Uh, do cats require more essential amino acids, thus making them obligate carnivores? Yes, uh, this talk was about dogs. <laughs> cats are not small dogs. Um, they require more protein in general than do dogs. And then they also have one more essential amino acid, taurine. Um, that can really only come from uh, animal-based ingredients. Uh, so it can be supplemented, um, but cats are, are different. So yes, they are obligate carnivores, unlike our dogs. Thank you so much. Uh, next question. Is starch good for dogs, though? What is the purpose of starch in their diet and for their health? So starch is primarily an energy source. Um, that is, that's the role that it plays in a dog's diet. Um, it can also, not the starch itself, but the ingredient that is carrying along the starch, you know, the uh, chickpeas or the lentils or, or whatever it may be, those ingredients can have many other health benefits as well. They can contain vitamins and minerals, um, uh, fatty acids, things like that. So the starch alone is an energy source for dogs and it is appropriate when included at an appropriate level in a dog's diet. Obviously you also need the appropriate levels of protein and fats and things like that as well. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, next question. Um, are food allergies common in dogs or is it a small number that suffer? They are not as common as uh, what we call environmental allergies. So allergies to pollens and molds, uh, mites, um, flea allergies, you know, things like that. Those are much more common uh, than food allergies. And so if you have a dog that is itchy and, you know, has some, you're pretty sure they have an allergy to something, what the veterinarians will usually do is first rule out the other common causes. So they'll look for, um, you know, flea allergies and put, put your dog on a really good flea preventative, try to suss out whether it's seasonal, um, you know, things like that. And then the next step after you kind of rule out some of the more common uh, causes of allergies or itchy skin um, would be to talk about the food allergies and whether you're interested in doing a dietary trial. Perfect. And then would you mind speaking to the relationship of legumes and cardiovascular disease? Are you talking about the uh, dilated cardiomyopathy? I assume that's probably what, what that question is, is getting to. Correct. So um, there is a, uh, several years ago, the Food and Drug Administration saw an increase in reports in non-genetic dilated cardiomyopathy in dogs. Um, most cases up to that point and still are uh, genetic, genetically uh, related. But they saw this increase and started um, very, you know, uh, veterinary research hospitals, uh, the government and all started trying to figure out what was going on. And it looked like diet might be playing a role. Um, unfortunately, we have not figured out what the cause is yet. Um, I wish I could give you an answer. Um, the, there was one study that showed a potential link with peas, but that same study also showed a potential link with, I believe it was chicken and turkey and rice, um, not as strong. You know, it's so, it, we, we just don't know is, is unfortunately what it boils down to. What I tell folks is um, you, there is no one right diet for every dog. And so you want to find the diet that works best for your dog. You know, so there are probably a subset of dogs out there that's something in the diet, whether it be the presence of something like peas at high levels or potentially the absence of something that, that those ingredients are replacing. Um, they do develop a problem uh, what, because we're seeing when they get onto a different diet that some of their symptoms disappear. Um, but then for other dogs, that's not seemingly to be, that doesn't seem to be an issue at all. So I wish I could give you an answer. I wish I, I knew uh, what the what the cause of that was, um, but the answer right now is, is we just don't know. And so I would recommend that, you know, if you have specific concerns, um, you know, if your dog has heart problems, um, anything along those lines, um, or is a breed that's at risk for dilated cardiomyopathy, speaking with a veterinary nutritionist would certainly not, you know, would not be a bad idea. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Next question. Is it better to have canned food versus kibble? I've, I find
find that is really a personal choice. Um, again, the whole cat dog thing, uh, canned food has, or wet food has been shown to be uh, significantly better for cats than uh, dry food. I can't say the same for dogs. Um, both can definitely meet all of a dog's needs and be a wonderful source of that nutrition that goes over and above the minimums. Um, I think the main difference is that dogs are perfectly willing to drink as much water as they need from a bowl of water as long as it's, you know, clean, fresh water, where cats are physiologically designed to actually get as much water as they can from their food. So again, you know, they're, they're different species. So it's really a personal, a personal choice. All right. Next question. What about pesticides and fertilizers in plant-based foods? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a, 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 a something to consider, but not just for plant-based foods, really for all foods. Um, many of those chemicals that are used in the production of, uh, you know, plants uh, for food bioaccumulate in animal species. And so you can actually get higher levels, you know, if you feed those plants to a cow and then feed that cow to a dog. Um, so Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm always I'm very concerned about the overuse of those kind of chemicals um, in agriculture, but it's not a problem specific to plant based foods. It really applies to all all foods for both people and for our pets. And then can you feed a dog that's under one year old a vegan a vegan diet? There are not many dog foods that are plant based um, that are labeled for, um, for puppies. Um, so I, I believe there's one and I am not remembering it offhand. I could, uh, certainly let Jeff know and uh, do, do a little research and let him know, but most of the vegetarian and vegan dog foods are designed for adult maintenance. Uh, so that is depending on your dog breed anywhere from nine months to 18 months or so. And then what ratio of fresh home cooked to commercial food can, uh, can be fed to ensure balanced nutrition? It depends how you are cooking your dog's food. Um, if you are cooking your dog's food from a recipe that was designed by a veterinary nutritionist to be complete and balanced, you can really use whatever ratio you want to um, because you have a complete and balanced commercially prepared food and a complete and balanced home cooked food. If you're talking more along the lines of, um, you know, I just, I'm going to um, grill up a little meat or I'm going to um, do some, you know, veggies and brown rice or whatever it might be. Um, then I wouldn't recommend going much more than 20% uh, for the home cooked food. Um, the, you can start running into some nutritional uh imbalances when you go more than 20% um, with a supplement like that. Thank you. And then this is a probably more of a personal question, but do you have any advice to vegan dog parents on how they can talk to other dog parents or veterinarians who do not believe in that lifestyle? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one <laughs> for sure. Um, one thing I will tell a lot of people who are it's it's not that they're completely against it. You know, I don't there I don't think there's much you can say to the people who are um, just you know 100% convinced that their dog needs to eat meat. Um, that's probably a lost cause. Um, but there are many many more people who are you know kind of on the fence thinking about it. Um, what I tell people is it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, it it let's say you have two dogs and you feed both of those dogs, a mixture of half vegan dog food and half traditional regular dog food, you have one vegan dog equivalent there, <laughs> you know, so you've done a lot of good. Um, so th that's my, uh, that's my, uh, all, my recommendation to people who are maybe a little hesitant is if you're interested, try it, go slow. Um, you know, any kind of diet change can cause gastrointestinal upset for dogs. So you want to, you know, mix the, the new in with the old, you know, very gradually over the, a week or two. 
Um, and then you don't have to go all the way. You know, you can you can certainly stop at the point where you feel comfortable. And um, my hope would be that, you know, you, you convince somebody to give it a try. They're feeding their dog 50-50. They see everything's going great. And maybe they're willing to go a little further, you know, in a month or so. And then, you know, maybe eventually they get there. But if they don't, they're still doing a lot of good. Thank you. Is protein from any source, animal or plant, one and the same? Yes and no. Um, so yes, when you get down to that amino acid level, it does not matter where the valine comes from. You know, if it can come from a plant or an animal source. Um, where it can differ is in digestibility and in bioavailability. Um, and what that means is that when you eat a protein, it actually needs to be broken down and absorbed to uh, play those roles in the dog's body. And so if you have a very indigestible protein, um, it, a lot of it's going to just pass right through and end up in your backyard. Um, so both plant and animal sources of protein can be either highly digestible or not. Um, so you do want to be looking at um, what the manufacturer is telling you about digestibility. Um, but that, again, that applies to both plant and animal sources of protein. You, know, you can have a very lean, you know, beautiful slice of white meat chicken, and that's going to be highly digestible. But if you're using, um, you know, poultry byproduct meal, that is not going to be very uh, highly digestible. And then the same thing applies with plants as well. Um, last question. What is the importance of looking for taurine in plant-based pet foods? So for cats, it's absolutely essential. Um, I personally, even though I am a vegetarian, I don't recommend vegetarian and vegan cat foods um, because they are obligate carnivores. And I always think, you know, if, if you're not willing to feed them the way they're meant to be fed, you should get a dog, you should get a bunny. You know? <laughs> um, when it comes to dog food, taurine is technically not an essential amino acid. So technically they should be able to do, most dogs should be able to do fine on a, do, on a food that is not supplemented with taurine. However, um, there has been some research that showed some dog breeds, some lines in certain dog breeds may need more taurine. It may be conditionally essential for those dogs. So many high quality dog foods will supplement with taurine um, to cover those individuals. And it's also just kind of a better safe than sorry. A little extra taurine is not gonna do any harm and it could potentially uh, do some good for certain dogs. Amazing. And actually, can I sneak one more question? I'm so of sorry. <laughs> All right. do, dog, do dogs need plants or fiber? Depends how you look at it. Um, so, Fiber first. Um, some fiber, yes, they do. Uh, it would be, and this is not from a nutritional point of view, by definition, fiber passes through the intestinal tract and does not get digested. But I, they're just like us, if you didn't eat any fiber, things could get a little little hairy. Um, you would have problems with constipation, potentially even diarrhea. Um, so some fiber to keep everything running smoothly. Um, absolutely. Dogs benefit from that. Um, do they need plants? Um, yes. Uh, they cannot eat a solely meat-based diet. Uh, that is not nutritionally complete and balanced. So, you know, if you fed your dog only um, steak and chicken and pork and absolutely nothing else. You know, you didn't mix it with some rice. You didn't do any, you know, mix it with some oatmeal, whatever. Um, you would run into nutritional, uh, problems there. So yes, they do require, uh, plant material at some level. Thank you so much. I promise I'm not going to ask any more questions at this <laughs> point. Really, this was just so incredibly informational. I want to thank every person who showed up today and asked such wonderful questions. Dr. Coates, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your time thank with you. us. I sincerely hope that we have you back again for another session, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day.